So today what we're going to be talking about is using Florida plants mostly to do landscaping for honeybees. We're going to go through a 12 month calendar of foraging so that every month that you have something, um, and this is really for application for backyard beekeepers, it's not really for people who are commercial beekeepers, um, but for those that have a few hives, this is definitely going to help your bees get through the year. Um, the next thing we're going to talk about is our Florida lawns and what we can do to improve for bees with our Florida lawns and sticking away from the commercial lawn that you see everywhere in these gated communities. And then I'm going to give you a list of local native nurseries where you can buy some of these plants. And then I'm going to talk about Julia Morton, who was a botanist. I mean, she was just this amazing woman. She actually has an online um, essay, or um, I guess it would call a small book. I've got it printed up there of about beekeeping. And this was how long, how old ago? 1964. So this was 1964. This woman was just so advanced. And it, it gives you descriptions of plants, um, the bees, what they're getting, uh, nectar or pollen, um, the time of year and location, Palm Beach or the West Coast, East Coast. And then lastly, I'm going to talk about my top 10 native plant countdown. And I have those in front of you. I'm really hoping that all of you will consider trying to get these in your yard. It's just amazing. The bees love it. Um, so we'll go to, and, and I guess the biggest question is, is why we're doing native plants. Because obviously there's a lot of plants that work for our honeybees. Um, but for us, we have a native nursery. Richard was one of the um, founding fathers of the Native Plant Society. And native plants, less water, less work, um, no pesticides, less care, you know, floods, hurricanes, all this good stuff. It makes it so we have a lot more time to, to care for our bees. So that's why we're going mostly with native. Um, but I'm going to start with something that nobody wants to see, especially me. I've, I have been <laughs> um, against a dead landscape from day one. I deal with a lot of customers uh, who, oh, Melissa, I want my grass this and I want my grass that. Well, you know what? I don't do that. Um, this is a dead landscape. This is a landscape where people mow it every week. They spray it with pesticides. They spray it with fungicides. Um, it has no life in it. It has no wildflowers. Nothing ever gets to flower. It is a dead landscape, and I am an advocate against dead landscapes. Go to the next one. What I like to see is, as you can see in the right, and this is actually from my own backyard, um, all, the, all the pictures are, is what I call a Florida yard. And a Florida yard is basically pretty much whatever grows. Now, there's some things that we don't want growing in our Florida yard, that like Bedelia and other things. But these particular things, like the spermacosi, the false buttonwood to the right, Basically, when, when there's nothing for our bees in the winter months, this, this will sustain the hive. I mean, the bees forage on this. Tomorrow, we're actually having a workshop at our apiary and nursery. I still left a part of this unmowed, just so you can see. Um, butterflies, bees, it is an amazing plant. Um, the one to the upper left is mimosa, mimosa strigulosa. That is actually blooming right now too. And you know what? You can mow all this stuff. So when you need to do a mow, you can mow it. You can alternate mowing it. You know, preferably what I like to do is I like to do a perimeter planting so nosy neighbors can't see inside. And then I do alternate mowing depending upon what's in flower, what's in bloom. The lowest one, um, you're probably all familiar with that, that's called Richardia. I think they call it Florida Pusley. And that usually blooms in drier months in March. The bees love that too. Again, something you can mow. None of this stuff needs supplemental irrigation, doesn't need fertilizing, you know, needs very little. And you can mow it when you need to mow it. But this is, this is what Florida should be striving for. We shouldn't be striving for a dead landscape. We shouldn't be putting our resources money and time into a dead landscape. We need to have a live landscape. And you know, not only that, but also fleabane, lyre leaf sage, coreopsis, so many wildflowers come out this time of year. Now, when they're finished flowering and other things, when we get our nectar surge, then you can mow this. But in the winter months, when you have nothing else, it's really beautiful. People just need to relax. We're not in Ireland or Scotland. We don't need these green expanses of lawn that just provide nothing. And you know, the slide before, when you see that dead landscape, it's one of our neighbors. I'm not going to tell you 
<laughs> but you know what? You never see anybody there. <laughs> There's nobody on that lawn, um, nobody human or otherwise. So it's really a sad place. <laughs> Richard, did you want to elaborate anything on that? Go back. I covered it. Okay. So another, you know, so what I'm going to also be showing you is some landscapes that a lot of you can apply in your own yard. I've been to a lot of the houses here and, you know, in the acreage or western Delray, a lot of you have ponds. And even in gated communities or other areas, they're, they're dead landscapes too. There's nothing around the ponds. Now I get the fact that people want to have a water view, but you can have a bee nectar source with your pond just by planting simple things. You know, a nice combination of things that are blooming in different times of the year. Right now, pickerel weed, which is actually in the water, it's a plant in the water, is blooming. The bees love it. Arrowhead, a small section of that. Even water lily. And water lilies are important because bees will drown. They actually need a surface that they can actually go on to, to, to get their water from. And then going up the, the edge of the of the embankment, Tupelo. So Tupelo does grow down here. At the nursery we have what? We have three? So we have three species of tupelo. We have Ogichi tupelo, we have the swamp tupelo, and what was the other one? The water and then the water tupelo. And we actually do get tupelo honey on certain years. Um, this year was not the best year, but last year and the year before it was phenomenal. So sometimes when you get a nice extended cold snap, but the bees love it. I mean, it just sounds like a freight train in the nursery. Um, and that, again, that's at the water's edge. Also, going up a little bit, you have button bush, which, which is just starting to go into bloom. Um, it's deciduous, so you don't see in the winter. Uh, what else is up there? Swamp dogwood. Now, I love swamp dogwood. It's, it's kind of a weird, weird love with this plant. It smells kind of like, um, like low tide in the key. Flowers do, but the bees really, really love it. Um, what else is there? Oh, um, the uh, amorpha. So amorpha is another plant that's deciduous right at the water's edge. The bees forage on that um, with pollen. You go up a little bit, wax myrtle, wild coffee. They have wild coffee along here at Pine Jog. You're going to see bees. And I love wild coffee because it has an extended bloom period. Then royal palm, dehoon holly, male and female. The female flowers I'm finding produce more nectar than the male flowers. Then a maple tree. A maple tree is a huge source for bees because it's the only thing that's really blooming in December. So there's pros and cons with maples. They don't do really well with hurricanes, but if you have an area where it's good soil, a little bit more wet, away from houses, you know, a maple tree is key for, for your bees, for your apiary. Anything that you wanted to add? No? no? He doesn't want to add anything. So just as, this is the list of plants that I would give as an example for a small pond landscape. Again, the tupelo, the royal palm, maple tree, dahoon, wax myrtle. It's interesting with Julia Morton, the wax myrtle, they actually would take it, branches of it, and put it in inside tree cavities, and swarms would, would automatically uh, come to these cavities. And this is, you know, we're talking a little, 60 years ago. Swamp dogwood, again, smells like low tide. Uh, bastard indigo is a common name. Amorpha is the botanical name. Button bush, pickerel weed, arrowhead. So that would be a nice. Let's go to the oh, let's go to the pictures. So these are the pictures. I mean, isn't that beautiful? I mean, could you imagine that around your pond? Um, and if you can see the amorpha, look at that bee. Look at the orange nectar, orange pollen. Um, Pickerel weed just starting to go into flower right now. Dehoon holly, again, tiny little flowers, maybe not so ornamental for us, but the bees love it. And then the far left, that's, um, that's actually uh, Ogichi tupelo. That's, uh, we have that in flower right now at the nursery. So on to the next. So a wildflower landscape. Now everybody has room in their yard for a wildflower landscape. And basically it can be a small contained area. You can formalize it with a little border. Keep it contained. I, I have a, you know, we, we have 11 acres, but in our backyard I have a wildflower landscape. And, and mainly before I was a beekeeper, you know, I'm avid into butterflies, painted buntings, migrating birds. But there's so many multi-uses for a wildflower garden, but the bees also love it as well. And I don't trim mine until after the uh, painted buntings leave, but 
you, you know, everybody needs to have this. A Dutropa, which is not native, but it just seems to flower all year. The bees really love it. Bahama Strongbark, a really strong summer bloomer. Um, Salvia, dune sunflower, Malokia. Malokia all year except for when it's really cold. And I know this, we'll talk about Spanish needles later, but it really is a bee saver, uh, especially in the winter months when there's nothing else going on. So I really encourage, if nothing else, do a wildflower landscape for your bees. You'll get hummingbirds, painted buntings, butterflies too. So it's, it's not just about the bees. I mean, I'm, the focus tonight obviously is about the bees, but there'll be more to enjoy it than just the bees. So go to the next one. And that's the list there. So if you are interested, you can go back uh, on the presentation on the website and take pictures of that. And that gives you a list. And these are just the pictures. I mean, look at these bees. They're just loving this. They're loving life. So gray leaf Malokia is one of my favorites all year, except for when it gets really, really cold. I mean, the bees just go after it after foraging. To the far left is the strong bark Boraria. That's a strong summer bloomer. When nothing else, you know, after our nectar flow, like right now, the strong bark, um, is huge for the bees. Also hummingbirds, butterflies, it's just a great summer bloomer, provides a lot of nectar for the bees. And then we'll, we'll address Spanish needles later. <laughs> I actually ran into somebody who used to be an inspector. He's like, yeah, there's a love-hate relationship with Spanish needles. And you know, if you love your bees, then you're gonna have to love needles too. <laughs> so I'll go to the next one. So, and there's some more. So there's the spiderwort. Spiderwort just fin stopped, uh, finished blooming. That is a spring bloomer, but the bees really go after it. It opens in the morning, closes in the afternoon. Um, salvia, actually at the today's auction today, we brought some salvia in. The bees seem to go after that. And then dune sunflower, that's another great plant. Um, it's funny, some, you know, bees will sometimes forage heavily in certain areas and, than others, depending upon what's in bloom. Uh, some of my coastal clients, they, their bees are all over their dune sunflower. So go to the next one. So for example, this is just a quick example of a home landscape, and this could pretty much be applied anywhere. And again, you know, the way that I try to operate because I don't like nosy neighbors and I don't like fences is I do a perimeter planting. And I don't want a monoculture. I don't want a, a ficus hedge, which is a dead hedge, and I don't want a rica palms that provide nothing for wildlife. I want a rich mixture so that things are happening at all times of the year. And it's not just for the bees, it's for us too. I mean, this is something for for us to enjoy as well. And of course I included some fruit trees because you know what, if you live in Florida, why not? And it definitely benefits the bees as well. So the style that I usually do with landscaping, um, and I guess nobody introduced us, but I've done landscaping now for 30 years. My husband's a botanist, he works for Audubon. Um, we've done state awards, local awards for some of our landscaping, the Native Plant Society and he's actually the Audubon manager for Bingham Island right now. So we do actually have some history with plants. <laughs> so nobody introduced us that way, but I'll just throw that in there. So my style of landscaping is the front's a little bit more formal, perimeter planting, and then my back is my wild paradise. I try to eliminate sod, not Florida lawn so much, but sod. I don't like mowing. Uh, typically native landscapes don't require as much maintenance as other landscapes and when you put the right plant in the right place you find less work involved. Um, but just as an example, gumbo limbo, necklace pod, Jamaica capers in bloom right now, saw palmetto, you know, there's just a rich variety. In fact, our own home landscape, how many, how many different species of native and non-native? So we have less than an acre on just the homestead and we have over 300 native and how many non-native? Um, Another hundred. So just on less than an acre, we have that high diversity. That doesn't include the nursery. Um, it doesn't include the 360,000 acres that we back up to at the refuge. But you know what? Bees don't want to have to work that hard if they can find it at home. So this would be a typical landscape. And again, a couple of canopy trees in there, lower growing, understory. You know, um, go on to the next. 
and that's kind of a list of, of when it blooms. So like the gumbo limbos, the gumbo limbos right now where we're at, they are just, we can't wait to flower. They're waiting for these rains to pass. And you know what, the bees in the morning and the evening, I've, I've had bees foraging on the gumbo limbo. It sounds like a freight train right before dark and into dark and same thing in the morning. Uh, horizontal cocoa plums just in bloom right now. Black bee, that's a great plant that blooms in February. Capers are, are blooming right now. Pigeon plum, saw palmetto is blooming right now. Crabwood's an, another one that's later in the summer. So again, you know, timing what you're putting in your yard too so that you don't have a nectar dearth. So making sure, and again, this is for smaller uh, beekeepers. This isn't for commercial, but even commercial beekeepers could benefit from putting this in their yard. When I see Sierra, I always bring her up something. I just, we were just up there last week and we brought her a black bee. She was very excited. <laughs> so on to the next one. A fire bush like we I just we gave Angie. Simpson Stopper is one of my favorites. I just love it. Sable palms, you know, they're they're on and off all summer. Bees really love that. Wild coffee right now. Some of the non-native strawberry tree is a phenomenal uh, tree. It's fast growing. It doesn't last long. It can be a hurricane problem. So again, thinking about that near your house. I don't like hurricane problems, so my planting around the, my prop, you know, my close to my house is really solid. Avocado is great for the bees in the winter. Live oak, sky flower, which is Jacamonte. I brought a sample of that in, and that's a nice winter bloomer. So go ahead. Home landscape, uh, red tip cocoa plum. So there's several different types of cocoa plum. Red tip is more of a hedge. Horizontal is more of a, a skirting plant under canopy trees or uh, something a little bit lower. The, the pavonia. So pavonia is, um, you know, and some of these things are, are island. They're close Caribbean uh, plants. Pavonia is from ba the Bahamas, and you can't find it in the trade. I'm, we're actually going to do cuttings, and I'm going to bring that in for the beekeepers. When it's in bloom, when nothing else is in bloom, the nectar is just dripping out of it, and the bees are just gorging themselves. Thatch palm, I love it because it's in a shade area. Star fruit's great in the summer months. Uh, white stopper, willow bustics in bloom right now, bitter bush. Now, bitter bush is kind of funny. It was listed in Julia's, but I'm watching my bitter bush and I'm not seeing a lot of bee activity, but there's so many other things, so maybe that's just a. So that's a picture of a bitter bush. There's a strawberry tree that's non native, but the bees really love it. There, okay, so to the far left, that's pavonia, and I'll tell you what, nectar and pollen in months where there's nothing else, bees love it. Um, one is plenty for any home because it can get really big. It can be unruly during a storm. Saw palmetto, obviously really beautiful. Wild coffee, you know, great native. Um, so that's the black bee. That's the one that we brought up to Sierra. That is just such an important bloomer. It blooms in February and it's explosive and it takes up, you know, a big chunk of property in the yard. It's probably, what would you say, 10 feet wide by 8 feet tall and, and the bees are just on it. They love it at a critical time when nothing else is blooming. Sky flower, it can, that can, you know, it's a well-behaved vine. I like that. Thatch palm, uh, you can see the berries on that. It's just such a pretty palm too. There's no reason why we can't have a landscape for our bees and enjoy it too, that, that, as humans, that we enjoy that. So coastal uh, landscape, a little different. If you're in Del Rey, you know, obviously you're not gonna wanna put Dahoon Holly or some of the more wetland plants, but Gumbo Limbo, Buccaneer Palm, Sea Grape is great. Um, crabwood is fantastic. Paradise trees, highly overlooked. They bloom in a certain year. Nothing else is blooming. And again, you know, just doing high diversity, doing a perimeter planting, keeping out the nosy neighbors with the dead landscape that want to call code and zoning on you. So this is how I manage my property and, and try to get other people to manage it as well. So to the next one. So just adding a few to the coastal home landscape, and of course there's more than, than you saw in the, the picture there. But lignum vitae, so that's a picture of the lignum vitae. That is a great uh, bloomer. It blooms February, March. Bees love it. The buccaneer palm to the right, that is a Rolls Royce palm in the landscape. It's like a miniature royal palm. Uh, if a customer in Atlantis, and I'll tell you what, um, the bees are on there so loud on that one tree with two or three flower spikes. They love it. Paradise tree is dioecious, male and female. 
It's one of the first bloomers and uh, the females provide this beautiful red fruit. So again, if you're coastal, you can do that. So more coastal is the uh, horizontal cocoa plum. Below it, Jamaica caper, which is in bloom right now. One of my favorites, gumbo limbo. I mean, look at the picture of that gumbo limbo. It is just stunning. And then the, below it's a little bit blurry is the flowers. Again, they're just starting to go in bloom where we are. They could already be in bloom where you are. It depends on where you're located. The next one. Um, and, oh, Simpson Stopper, one of my favorite. Bees just love it, love it. Sable Palms, now I don't see any bees on that because this is an old picture from when I was really doing a butterfly presentation. But the bees love it as well. And again, it blooms through the summer months. So, and okay, and we're on to our nurseries. So there's several nurseries that are local. Obviously, you can go online. You can go to Homestead if you want to. Um, you know, one of the things about about the nurseries is that um, you've got to ask whether people are spraying in their nursery. And I can't vouch for anybody other than than us, but we're a commercial nursery, and. The ways to find out if people are spraying pesticides in their nurseries is to see if there's insects on their plants, number one, insect damage on their plants, number two. Obviously, if you're bringing things for your bees and they're sprayed, you don't want to be harming your bees. Again, these are all great people, but I'm not going to vouch for anybody. Um, but you can call some of these. Some of these are open on Saturday. I would always suggest that you call ahead for availability to see if they have what you're looking for, but these are all close by us. Um, Indian Trails, she's actually down the road from us, and, she, and uh, Meadow Beauty, they're not too far. Actually, all of these are, are pretty close. Then they, they might have some rare stuff that you're looking for. Go ahead. And then Julia Morton. So. Julia Morton, she is just, again, this amazing woman who is a botanist, way ahead of her time. She has written several books on Florida's poisonous plants, um, but one of the best is, is about honeybees of, of South Florida. And I would really encourage anybody and everybody to go online and look at her list. It would be kind of cool if actually the Palm Beach Beekeepers Association got permission to reprint, reprint this and start adding to it so that we could have our own collection of information for our beekeepers. And part of that would be whether it's native or non-native, where it comes from, if it's invasive or not invasive, um, nectar or pollen, uh, where you're located. But it would be a really great undertaking if I, oh, oh, Lee wants to, see that. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> All right. <laughs> he was waving his hand, yes. Um, but it would just be a, a great thing that, because you know what, some of the people that we've talked to here about plants, they've talked about things that they think that bees are going to be on, and a lot of things bees are not on, or I've never seen bees on. And so, and there's always a priority of what bees prefer and what they don't prefer, lowest to highest, and obviously they'll go after the least what they prefer. But starting up for this, for especially for new backyard beekeepers, would actually help them and their bees do the correct planting. There's nothing worse than planting the wrong thing and then later having to take it out after spending the money or, you know, it's just not something desirable. So. I think it's a good place for us to start. And I have people asking me all the time, what should I plant? I want to do this. I want to do that. And I think it's a great place for us to start to, to do that here. You know, this is such a great organization. It's big. And, you know, Palm Beach County is a big area, so why not? Did you want to add anything about Julia? Um, sure. Well, again, uh, under underappreciated. Uh, her paper on the bees was published in the Florida State Histor uh, Horticultural Society. These are big volumes that come out once a year. I think they're still published. Uh, that was published in 1964. But prior to that, she was looking at plants in Florida and the Bahamas, uh, native, exotic, long before anyone else was. She had written books on native plants. She was one of the first to point out that some non-native exotics were getting away and people did not believe her. They just ignored her and she was right. Uh, the Shofia tree, I'm sure they already had Brazilian pepper down in Miami in the 60s I think and uh, on and on but uh, she, 
she wrote books on fruit trees, on poisonous plants, on medicinal plants, uh, probably a dozen or more publications you can find online. But this paper is obscure. It is online, but it'd be nice to have a printed copy, printed by the beekeepers, mm -hmm. and circulate that. And as Melissa said, we can start our own uh, modern version, addending or appending or, or modifying that. But what she had in her, what she has in her paper <clears throat> is um, basically from the Keys and Miami, it, stretching up to Palm Beach and over the West Coast towards Sanibel. And she noticed differences in the quality, the beekeepers told her differences in the quality of the nectar based on the soil the plant was growing in. I had never heard that in my life. I'm mm -hmm. sure some of you do know that. Um, so the observations are better than anything I've, I've ever read. Mm -hmm. And this, again, is a paper that very few people have seen. Um, so I strongly recommend you try to get permission. I'm sure they'll give you permission to reprint it as a little booklet. Thank you, Richard. Okay, so um, if somebody could get the lights. So what I'm going to do now is my, my top 10 countdown for native plants. And again, this is Julia Morton. Um, it's probably about 20 pages, but it also tells you about the quality of honey, whether they're actively foraged, whether there's a surplus of honey from these plants. I mean, it's just really valuable. And I wanted to bring this book also because, I mean, there's a lot of native books, but this is Dr. George Rogers. He's at Palm Beach State. And what I love about this book is he talks about Florida lawns. He talks about weeds. Nobody talks about weeds. And weeds are really, really important to know what what's beneficial, what's not. And so even going online or looking about his section on, um, on Florida lawns and weeds. He calls them weeds, I call them Florida lawns. So my top 10, and then after I'm finished, uh, Steve is gonna take over. He's gonna do some 101, I think, with the, um, the hives. But I wanna finish with my top 10. And it, there's nothing better than just actually seeing the plant. So this is black bead. This was the picture that we showed you of this massive, you know, 10 feet wide and eight feet tall. Um, it's, it's a caliandra, so it's a powder puff family. The flowers are like a beige pink. Some of them are fragrant, you know, it's a light fragrance. The bees just love it. They love it, love it, love it. So after the bees are finished with that, and I think it blooms twice a year, but I notice it most when the bees just need something, and that's in that February month. Yeah, but after it finishes flowering, it then gets these beautiful seed pods, and they bust open, and there's a, 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 a pink um, outer hanging with a shiny black seed. It's just really ornamental. You know, put plants in the right place so that you don't have to do a lot of work. I don't trim mine. I don't like to be doing trimming. <laughs> I'm busy. I don't have time to be doing um, busy work, dead lawn, landscape stuff. So put this in the right place. Full sun, well-drained, drought tolerant. Once it's established, walk away from it. Great plant. Birds, butterflies, hummingbirds. Yes? Hurricane tolerance fine. You know, it doesn't get that big. It doesn't really have anything, you know, you know, depends on the hurricane, but, you know, Florida natives, like, uh, we've gone through all the way from Wilma before Andrew, and this is, this is lower to the ground. It's sprawling. So this is, this is Pithecilobium kiensis is the botanical name. The common name is blackbead. Um, great, great. This would be my number one for all of you folks to have in a full sun, well-drained, high, dry area. Even a little bit of shade. Great for bees. No fuss. So the second one would be gray leaf, and I love my gray leaf. I'm, I'm just absolutely enamored with my gray leaf, and I, don't, I won't even sell them. <laughs> so the president of the Beekeepers Association, they're doing their auction, and she asked me if they could buy some, and I said no. <laughs> so it's hard to propagate, but, I, but um, you know, the bees are on. So, well, I'm trying to get the true answer on this. And so there's five different types of this, and some of them are less attractive to bees than others. So the ones that are less attractive to bees, this would be the, um, this, so this is tomentosa, this is the, um, the Malochia tomentosa. What is the other one, Richard? The one? Right. And those readily seed, but you know what? Nobody seems to be foraging on it. It's, it's just, you know. 
So, and, and I've done it by cuttings, but you know, out of 100 cuttings, maybe three plants. So, yeah, not easy. Miles Botanical on, on military sells the ground in their nursery. Okay. Again, you got to make sure it's the right one. Sometimes they can look similar. And, you know, the best way sometimes to see is, is how heavily the bees are foraging. If it's the right one, they forage on this all month, all year. I'll, I mean, you know what? I was putting this in the truck, and the bees were following it into the truck. <laughs> they really love it. So, yes. Okay, yeah. So you've got the right one. And this is high, dry, very high, dry. So when I have clients that say, I've got a place and nothing will grow, and we put one of these, and oh, life is good. So this is where this needs to go. It, and it doesn't want to be outcompeted. Don't put it with other stuff where it's going to get smothered. Full sun, high, dry, difficult locations. This plant loves it. So this plant can get, oh, what do you say, Richard? Eight, eight feet tall? Eight feet, yeah. But, Exactly. And they don't live forever. You know, it's not, it's not a, a, you know, a, a solid thing in the landscape, but it's a fast grower, so that's fine. Um, they don't self-seed? They don't. <laughs> they, yeah, they don't self-seed. Um, the next one is, yes, yes. Do you recommend pruning that because I had it, I put it in, it was my fault. So there's a time of year that... So there's a time of year that you shouldn't prune it. It can be a little fussy that way. It doesn't like to be pruned in the winter. You know, a lot of things don't want a heavy prune in the winter, so don't do heavy pruning when it's going to get down to 40 degrees. You know, a lot of our native plants will respond. They'll be okay. Um, I do a light pruning if needed in summer months, um, but, but it's funny. It, it, you know, you can prune it, and it's very unhappy. Yeah. I have two of them. Okay. Okay. Uh, one of them was doing great. The other one, like, kind of almost died off. Okay. It got some type of fungus in the bark. Right. To where it was, and I just I sprayed the bark with some oils of some sort. Okay. And, uh, it seemed to help it. Hmm. And Started growing back again. So, you, so they can get they can get sooty mold and they can get it like a fungal problem. So yeah, that's why. The bark was kind of breaking and split apart. Yeah. So high, dry, well drained. I mean, I've seen this again. The driest, full sun, no competition. They're beautiful. Um, and you know, be patient. Sometimes when it's really wet and humid, there'll be a little bit of dieback. Don't worry about it. Again, this is not going to be your solid plant in the landscape. It's not going to last forever. It's not a gumbo limbo tree. It's not a sable palm. Um, but it grows incredibly fast, so it's going to benefit you while it's in the ground and doing well. And then, so my, my third favorite, I, I just love gumbo limbos. Must have been a good question. <laughs> so my third favorite is uh, gumbo limbo, and I just, I love gumbo limbos. I love everything about gumbo limbos. You know, we have several gumbo limbos in our yard. I just love them, love them, love them. The one picture you saw with the red shining bark, it is just loaded with flowers right now. Every single leaf is stripped off. It is just waiting, and the bees go bananas when it finally opens up. You know, they do go temporarily deciduous in the winter months. I've had clients recently call me, oh, my gumbo limbo's dead. No, it's not dead. It's just going through a leaf exchange. And it's an extended leaf exchange. But they're, they're dioecious. They're male and females. The females seem to provide more nectar than the males. The females also provide tiny little berries that migrating birds go crazy over. So even just today, there was a, a, a white-eyed vireo trying to get some of the last seeds off of the gumbo limbo. We had rose breast to grow speaks, Phoebe flycatchers. Um, it's a solid tree planted in the right place. It's more of a coastal tree, but you can plant it like where we are. It's up higher. You know, they do come down in storms if they're planted in the wrong spot. So if you're living west and it's flooded, then it's not going to have a good root system. Or if you bought a tree that was propagated by a cutting rather than by seed, you might not have a good root system. But it's a tough tree. It's soft. It's easy to manage. You can manage it yourself. I can't say enough good things about gumbo limbos. Gives you the shade in the summer when you need it. Drops the leaves when it's cooler in the winter. Great tree. Bees love it too. Um, everybody has room for a gumbo limbo. I have a question. Yes. Mm -hmm. I just of my okay. Go ahead. 
I just thought of mine. Okay, go ahead. Uh, you said earlier that, <laughs> yes. um, that it doesn't live forever. Right. Some really do live a long time. Yep. What would you say the lifespan of that is? It depends on where it's planted. Um, at least five, six, seven years, you'll probably have a good lifespan out of it. You know, part of the problem is people will plant them where they get um, outcompeted, so other things fill in. It doesn't like competition. Um, I'm trying to think, our, our client over in, in Palm Beach Gardens, the guy that did a painting for our house, he had a beautiful specimen. And it was, yes, full sun, no competition. So planting it in the right spot, it grows super fast. So, um, but the bees love it. I got a couple planted on the south side of my house where the sprinklers don't reach it. Okay, it see, e exactly. Yeah, ex Then you plant it in the wrong spot. <laughs> get get a new one and plant it in a better spot. <laughs> they don't move well, so you know certain things do move well. They don't. You know, again, it grows quickly. You can put something else there for now, or let the rest of your landscape fill in and get the right spot for it. Go ahead, Nancy. Um, I've got two gumbo limbo. Okay. I've never seen them flower. That doesn't mean that they haven't. Teeny, teeny, teeny. Some kind of sap. Where I've seen the pollinators, even the bees are on like the limbs and they're kind of shiny. So that's, you know what that is? That's aphids, and aphids will do that, especially during the dry season. And so, and actually, it's funny, and Julia Morton, she talks about bees getting, making bee honey from aphids. So that's, yeah, yeah, they'll do that. Ladybugs, Ladybugs are actually eating the aphids. That's a good thing. So that's a nice balance. But there's flowers. I mean, even... Yeah, and yeah, yeah, and that's the time of year too that it just does that. But you, you know, it's either male or female. The males tend to leaf out quicker than the females, so you might not see the flowers. You know, the females have fruit on them. They're they're tiny, but you'll see it. One is really tall. The other is short. And genetics and how it was propagated. It could be a lot of different things. Um, any other quiet? Go ahead. I have a, one thing on the gumbo limbo. It's a, it's a little trivia thing. Okay. That gumbo limbo was the preferred carving wood of carousel makers at the turn of the 19th, 19th 20th century. Huh. Well, that's an interesting fact. So it's soft wood. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hmm. How about that? Two things. Oh, yes. Uh, the strawberry tree. Well, yes. So that is what, Montingia, the strawberry? And is it, where, where is the, what is the origin? Central America. So it, ha it has little fruits and it kind of tastes, you know, some people like it. To me, it tastes like burnt cotton candy. I, I don't like it. Okay. So, okay. Okay. right. Okay. Right. It's, it's all. It seems to me they like all carambola. Right. You know, they, okay. it, they seem. No, that's the Latin name of carambola. Avaroa carambola. Oh, that it covers all of them? That, all of them are Avaroa carambola. Oh, okay. And then you have your variety after the Latin name. Right. right. It grows really fast. It doesn't last long. It's it, it will come down in storms. People have a tendency to, right. I mean, but, but you know what? Again, that's that's not going to be your backbone in your landscape. It's not, but it's still beneficial. You can get them fairly inexpensive. It's it's worthwhile. Some some people like the fruit. I'm 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 not, I'm not a big fan, <laughs> but you know some people really do like the fruit. Uh, squirrels love the fruit. I'm not a big fan of squirrels <laughs> either. Um, but so but they will come down the storm. T and you know that's another thing to think about when I do landscaping. I, I'd like to see more of a permanent landscaping, but obviously if you love plants, you're going to have a mix of everything. But where you're putting them, like don't put them under the power lines. Don't put them up against your house. You know, those are bad ideas. <laughs> but you can still benefit from them. Put them way off in the corner. Enjoy it. The star fruit is a great, it, it blooms during the summer months, and the bees really avidly go after that. Star fruit's good. I mean, I make juice out of it. It's okay. You know, it's not the strongest tree. It can come down too, but it can, it's okay. So the next one, I'm going to, you know what, I'm going to finish this up and then we'll do questions real quick and actually Richard can help too. So the next one that I really enjoy is a strong bark. Um, that's the uh, Beraria cassinifolia. 
and, or this is the succulenta, the cinefolia is the dwarf one. And strong bark is just this amazing tree. It has this weeping habit. It grows to be about 16, 18 feet tall with a t 8 to 10 feet spread. It's a great summer bloomer, so it blooms from June to December. And the bees will just be all over it, all summer long. Hummingbirds will be on it, butterflies will be on it, spot-breasted Oreos will be hanging upside down on it. It's just a really, really nice small tree. And then it's followed by orange fruits and the catbirds fight the mockingbirds and the cardinals. So this is a great tree, it's a fast grower, really drought tolerant, works well, can fit in anybody's landscape. Then the next one, um, Simpson Stopper. I just love Simpson Stopper. <laughs> You know, Simpson Stopper is just this amazing, um, can be a small tree or a, or a hedge. Uh, some of it's by genetics. It can have uh, curly red bark like the gumbo limbo or it can have gray bark. Um, to tell the difference between the stoppers, and how many stoppers, five, five stoppers, white, is, is crushing the leaf will give you that citrus citrus smell the other stoppers don't have. It's an extended bloom period, so it blooms April through May. Then it's followed by red edible berries. You can eat them, but I'm not a big fan of those either. Um, the birds like them. Uh, just a great, no nonsense, low maintenance, once it's established, drought tolerant, walk away plant. You know, something that you don't have to do a lot of work with. And, and you know, thinking about your landscape, think about that. How much work do you want to be doing? So make some good choices that you're, you're not removing things or having to trim every weekend. How tall would that go? So it can go up to 18 feet, Richard? 25, Okay. Okay, so in really wet conditions, it can get up 20, 25 feet. Um, drier conditions, probably a little bit less. Um, we have both. We have like a hedge, and we have single leader trees, and we didn't plant them that way. Just genetically, that's how they worked out. Um, tomorrow, we are having a workshop at the nursery in the apiary, and also doing an interpretive walk with plants. Uh, again, Richard is a botanist, so if you have questions about plants or anything like that, he's the man to go to. And also just to see what some of these things look like when they're fully matured. You know, it helps you do your own landscape planning. Wild coffee. I love wild coffee because this is a great plant for understory. Deep shade. It's in bloom right now. Kind of has a little bit of a citrus gardenia smell. Bees love it. Extended bloom period. Um, this gets to be about, I'd say, what, seven, eight feet tall, um, wide, four or five feet tall wide, but again, deep shade, so when you have places like, what can I plant there? It's all shade, nothing will grow. Wild coffee will grow. Shiny leaf, so it blooms in the spring, and then it's followed by these red berries. Um, birds love it. Uh, we don't eat it. Uh, lignum vitae. So lignum vitae is, is the common name, tree of life, blue beautiful flowers um, in, the, in late winter, so February, March. Bees go crazy over it. Then it has a flower, uh, what would you call that? A capsule that busts open orange seeds. Birds love it. Jacamontia, well-behaved vine. So these vines are not well-behaved. I grade them from 1 to 10. 10 being don't go anywhere near it. It will consume your landscape and your house. Very well behaved and manageable. Jacamontia. Now the flowers are closing up at night here, but gorgeous blue, purple flowers. It can cover a, ni a nice sized trellis, maybe an eight by six trellis. Blooms all winter, and that's why it's important for the bees. But it's also really pretty. I mean, again, we're not just plant planting for bees, we're, we're going to enjoy this too. Um, I'll wait till my, my last one, but sable palm, I love sable palms. You know, during what was it, the Hurricane Matthew? Was it her or Michael? Hurricane Michael last year, a Mexican beach. The only thing that was left standing were sable palms. So we actually have a two-story house, and when we first bought the house, the only thing that was on there was a couple of live oaks. Ficus hedge, areca palm. Ficus and areca were out the door before we even moved any boxes in. And we planted sable palms around the perimeter to give us shade and protection from storms. Um, love the boots. This is a cabbage palm. You know, people don't give enough credit for the cabbage palm. Cabbage palm is a great, no-nonsense palm. has boots. It's a, it, it's a whole ecosystem for bromeliads and orchids and vines. And, and the bees do love it. They do. 
They do. It is our state tree. Absolutely. So, you know what? Don't sell yourself short. If you have this growing your property, don't get rid of it. If you don't have them, get some. Be patient. It's a great flower spike. And then the last thing is, and I, you know, I thought back and forth a million times whether I wanted to mention this one at all, and it sort of got me. Um, is Spanish needles. It's a love-hate relationship. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I love it and I hate it. Uh, the bees, but if you love your bees, you're going to love it too. Now what you hate about it is when it goes to seed and you're wearing this, you're going to be covered with this. And they're spiky and they're miserable. And I actually had one of these things stuck in my bra and I was at a, an event last month and I couldn't move and I was just crawling out of my mind and I was just like, this is torture. <laughs> and of course, I found a little Biden's needle. But a plant for your bees, especially when nothing else is growing during the winter months. They are going to go after it for nectar. They're going to go after it for pollen. It's also the larva host for the dainty sulfur. It's also edible. It's also great chicken food. Food. Actually, painted buntings go after it. So other than, than this, which can be awful to deal with, it's a really good, good plant. And again, if you love your bees, you got to have some Spanish needles. It's, you know, if you get fed up with them, pull them out, give them to your chickens, throw them away. But um, I recommend everybody who's a beekeeper have some of this on their property and try to just manage it. You can weed whack it, mow it, whatever. Um, I think that's it. Richard, did you want to add something? So Richard's actually here. I don't know if anybody brought anything in for identification. There was one lady. Oh, there's a gentleman here. I have this little plant that grows wild all over my yard. It looks like the spermicosi. The honeybees love it. Yeah. All the natural native bees love it. Yeah. So that's, that's, so that's yeah. yeah. So that was in, right. And you know what? It, they do love it. They really do, and it's a great thing to have. And again, the time of year when nothing else is growing. And you know what? You can mow it when the nectar starts to, to flow. But in that time, you know, it's a great plant to have, and it's easy to manage. You don't have to water it or fertilize it or anything like that. Um, any other questions for any of the plants that we have here or plant identification or anything else? No? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I can't remember the name of it, but the so the, the number one yes, um, the Jacamontia. So it wants full sun to light shade. I mean, I've had some customers put it in areas and it, it will reach for, you know, you want to be able to enjoy it too. So it will reach for the light. So, so you could do it in a planter for a while. Um, you know, it would be best in the ground. I mean, there's some things you can keep in a planter, but there's other things that really want to get their feet in the ground. But you can do, you know, a small trellis or a lattice. So do, two, you know, two four by fours, a six foot of lattice, and put it in a, a fairly sun. It does want a little bit more water than not. So not extremely drought tolerant, but, um, you know, it, it lasts a long time. My bees love it, love it, love it. And then, you know, in the summer months, it's not flowering, so it's definitely just a solid winter bloomer from December to May. And then, um, and then it's just green leaves. But it's so well behaved. It's a good vine. You know, I've had clients tell me, oh, I want to do this, I want to do that. And I'm like, you're crazy. So, um, you know, nobody, well, <laughs> this one, yes. Think about the Mexican clover. So the Mexican clover. So the Retardia, right. So that's a Retardia. I think it's great. I think it's, it makes an excellent Florida lawn. I don't think it hurts anything. Is it considered invasive? Or it's, it's central. It's, um, right. It's not really, it doesn't seem to displace anything. It's in weedy areas. So who cares? Right. Right. So I mean, if, so if you're not going to have your dead landscape with the perfect lawn, and you're going to be smart about having a lawn, then it works out perfectly. And you know, people need to just get away from that, that, that royalty, Irish, Scottish, beautiful, perfect green lawn. We, we don't, it doesn't work here in Florida. And, and you know, you're just, you're poisoning our waters, poisoning our bees. Stop it. Just stop. <laughs> so enjoy it. You know, Richardi is, when it's in full bloom, when it's dry, usually like in March or other months, it's beautiful. It's really, and you can mow it. So low maintenance. Any other questions? Go ahead. Um, what should we not, what should we try to stay away from? Like, what, is there something that might be going in my yard I should 
Rip it out. So, so the, you know what? I actually grade weeds too on a one to ten, and I hate Wedelia. Hate it. Hate it. Hate it. Hate it. Can't stand Wedelia. Oh, so Wedelia will smother your landscape. What is the other one with the carrot root? So it might. It actually might be in uh, George Rogers book. I'd have to look. But you know the one with the carrot root. What is? Do you remember? Bazalzia. So there's another one, and that one's nasty that's too. To Brazilian pepper, melaleuca, Australian pine, chaflera, bishopia. But but these people do like Brazilian pepper and melaleuca. You know, it took me some time. It actually took me to be a beekeeper to to get it, to get the Brazilian pepper. That doesn't mean I want it growing in my yard, but I'll definitely benefit from other people's properties. <laughs> so. I, carrot wood is a terrible carrot wood's awful. Yeah. Category and, one invasive. Cut it down, rip it out, destroy it. That was kind of, I thought, <laughs> carrot wood. Yeah. So, just to add to one thing Melissa said earlier, <laughs> don't just think about what you're going to go out and buy and plant. Don't buy anything, don't do anything until you know what you have in your yard. Mm. And a lot of people don't know what they have. I just saw a picture of Pluki on the lawn of Canal Bank. Pluki is called uh, rosin weed or camphor weed. It's a great native wildflower. Mm. There's another one that grows vigorously, what you call Joe Pie weed. Ah. It's an incredible butterfly plant. It gets big and ragged. Leave it alone. Mm. Um, you may mm. have plants on your property that are already good, and mm. somebody, maybe your groundskeeper or somebody yourself, you're removing them. You're killing them. Mm. So identify what you have before you do anything. You might not need to buy anything. Mm. And go after all the exotic pest plants. Carrot wood, Australian pine, melaleuca, Brazilian pepper. Ah. I've spent 30 <laughs> years cutting down yeah. Brazilian pepper and I'll never stop. Air, air, leaf acacia. air leaf acacia, extremely and, and provides nothing, nothing. nothing. Air leaf acacia provides nothing for our bees. You've got these huge flower spikes of yellow flowers. You kind of get excited, almost like the Brazilian pepper. <laughs> you know, you're hoping. Nothing, nada. And not only that, the air leaf acacia during storms, it splinters. It splinters and it's just, you know what, you do not want that near your home. Um, you know, Sierra, we, we were talking, we actually helped her do a plant identification of her yard, and she has a pest problem with air leaf acacia that is just beyond control. And it's displacing other things that she could have there that could be beneficial, obviously, to her base. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, Eric? Yeah, um, I, was, I did a removal for a lady, and she had some acacia honey, but it was actually. So it's not. It's probably not the same acacia, right? Right. So it could be sweet acacia. Mm. And and most of those are thorny. So you know, again, user friendliness. Um, you know, I always kind of take a look at that as well because I. Yes. It depends on which one it is. If you find out the Latin name, we'll find out. We have some of our native vacations. So we have Cinecord, and we actually have, um, which doesn't have thorns. But it, the bloom period's so so limited, I can't imagine it would be um, it would be enough for a surplus of honey. So I'm sorry. Go ahead, sir. Um, two questions. Yes. First of all, what would you recommend for doing the hedging around your house to keep the nosy eyes out? So you know what, I, I don't like to do a monoculture hedging, so monoculture is all of the same thing, you know, like a ficus hedge, which, you know what, I don't plant ficus hedge, I refuse to plant ficus hedge, I will not plant ficus hedge for so many reasons, but you know, doing a mix, so doing a mix hedge planting, um, if you come to the workshop tomorrow, and I don't know if you're available to do that or not. We can show you what a mix planting. Our yard was on the garden tour for the Native Plant Society last year. And actually the last 10 years our landscapes have been on the Native Plant Society garden tours. So I like doing a mixed hedge. Things are happening at different times of the year. And who says a, ha a hedge has to be straight and narrow? Why can't you have things that are growing naturally rounded and a little bit tapered? You know, open, have, have a little bit of diversity and op open to this, this box kind of vision of what, what we think is a landscape. That is not landscaping. You know, that is, that is, yeah, thank you, hard work. <laughs> 
Um, the lady behind you. Hold on. I'm sorry. Absolutely. Well, I mean, there is some 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 symbiotic relationships with certain plants that do benefit each other, no doubt. But you know what? When you have a monoculture landscape and have all of one thing, and say there's an insect problem, or say there's a fungal problem, then you have a buffet table for that insect problem or that fungal problem. If you have high diversity and something comes in, you're not really going to notice it. So it's just really important to do high diversity landscaping um, for many reasons. Mm -hmm. I just want to actually put some input here. Uh, City codes are usually pretty specific. If your city or your homeowner association has a code that says a hedge, a perimeter hedge cannot be higher than X feet, we'll use six feet as an obvious mm -hmm. standard. Uh, the word hedge actually has a definition, so don't say mixed hedge. That okay, so mixed planting. Say a mixed planting. Right. And it could be mixed trees, and all of these could be small trees. Right. Officer for landscape. Mm -hmm. I get a complaint that this person is letting their hedges go too high. Right. I get to that house, and what I see is 12 plants down the side of this uh, fenced area, mm. but each one is a different species. I don't care if they're 15 feet high. There you go. It's not a hedge. Exactly. A hedge is a repeated planting of the same wow. material. Wow. Good, good to know. Actually, good to know. Right. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, not all code officers are perhaps as sophisticated because I was specifically a landscape officer. Okay. But it's just good to know. It is good a to know. Mixed planting mm -hmm. does not have to follow the same rules as a hedge, which is a repeat of the same right. plant on an even spacing. You're right. And I'm sorry, uh, the, the, I'm going to ask the gentleman behind you. Is there a good app for those of us that don't know where most of these plants are that shows pictures? Um, right. So a good app. To there, I just saw about two weeks ago an app called um, Plant, some plant app. It's very primitive, and uh, it doesn't work well here. It works. It's made for Southern California. There might be something coming out on the line, but uh, George Rogers' book has a lot of very good photographs in it. And sometimes just flipping through, you'll find the plant you're looking for. Uh, otherwise. Well, you know what? I'm I'm gonna I'm actually gonna put you in the, another direction too. Go to some of the Native Plant Society meetings. Every year they have a garden tour, and they you know they actually there's some prerequisites for what qualifies for the garden tour. But you'll be able to see what could work for you. And they actually have an auction coming up on the 21st of May, and that's at Mounts. And they're going to be having some of these plants available for the auction. And I'm gonna leave these flyers up up front here, and you can go there. Um, um, other examples, take a look out here at Pine Jog. We actually, uh, Richard and I had did the beach area, what, what was that, 10 years ago? I don't know, 10, 12 years ago. So look at some of the plants around here. Look at some of your natural areas, um, even Wakotahatchee, Green K Wetlands. You'll see things that can be used, native plants, to kind of get what you're looking for. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I'm finished. Okay. Mm. Yeah, I just want to take you back with what the uh, court officer said because I had problems with court officers on my Spanish needle. Yeah. Uh, the one that this gentleman had here, uh, the court office came around. Yeah. And I had one side of the uh, yard cut, the mm. other side I left with the bees. Right. Stuff. And I was still, these are weeds. <laughs> So this is why I always do a, a perimeter planting so nosy neighbors cannot see what's going on inside your yard. And then, you know what, and I always do the mowing on the outside of our yard. And, and where we live, nobody's going to complain. But it's just practice from where I've lived before and also practicing what I preach to my customers. So you can maintain the outside so it looks formal, clean, and neat. The inside's yours, and nobody should be poking their nose in there. So that's why I would do a definition. And if you have bees, you kind of want that anyways. You don't want, you know, somebody. Mm. Mm. The reason for that is that the state of Florida defines Spanish needle as a weed. Yeah, and I try to tell them because I'm from Jamaica, and we use it there all yeah. the time. Mm. And it did not make a difference. So that's why I say keep it in a. It here right. 
So that's why I say put it in defined wildflower garden. So even just taking old logs or anything, a, a rectangle or square, whatever, and put your Spanish needles in there, and this is my wildflower garden. You know, so you can do that. You can get away with that. <laughs> but again, keeping nosy people out, People who have these, these dead lawns, I have a word for them. Richard asked me not to use it here. <laughs> it starts with G-R-A-S-S, -S, and then we'll go further than that. But these people, they, you know what, they think that they're living in Europe, they think they're royalty, and it's sad. They spend so much time wasting money, time, water, pesticides on something that just doesn't belong here. It just doesn't. And so I get frustrated with, with, with customers like that. I've actually had customers where I'm just like, I, I can't help you. <laughs> I don't want to help you. <laughs> so go ahead. Um, just a note on that. They, they, used, they used to sell them at home deep of the scanning. So really? That's home. funny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's very funny. I have a question. Um, yes. Uh, you mentioned the lily, lily pads. Is there any type to stay away from? Or? Well, there's, there is. Actually, lily pads, he's asking if there's any type to stay away from that might be like spatter, spatter dock can get really aggressive. I don't know how big your pond is. Is that the yellow? Yes. Yeah. 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 That can get pretty aggressive. And the white, white one? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's good. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's not good. No. If you want a mosquito farm, leave that. So, yeah. You'll enjoy your bee and mosquito farm. So, go ahead. I'm sorry. In the way in the back. Hi there. I do have a fire ear trees. They're so big. What are they? The bees love it, but I don't know if they're good for them or not. What is it called? Ear trees. Ear trees? Yes. They're really mm -hmm. good. Oh, that's your cat. It's just ear leaf. Ear trees. Ear trees. Mm. They have a, like, a, what color is it? Like an ear. Oh, ear. So that's, that's the ear leaf acacia? Yeah. So I've never seen a single bee in any ear leaf acacia I've come across. I, but I, I do have a, mm. like five of them. When I go on the trees, like a helicopter on top, it's a lot of bees on top. Uh, I don't know what to say. I, I don't know. I don't know what to say. I've never seen a bee in them. Um, it's not a good tree. It well, it, it might be a different tree altogether. It could be something else. I don't know. There you go. There you go. Seriously. There you go. <laughs> so 9, 9.30. So basically 9.30. And I think that Kevin's going to get into the apiary just to do for some of our new beekeepers. So we have eight hives. Um, he's going to go in real quick. And then we're going to just try to beat the, the afternoon rains and just do an interpretive tour of the yard. You can see some of the wetland plants and other things we've been talking about in bloom, see how big they get. So that's going to be probably around, I guess, 10.30, about an hour in the hive. I don't know where Kevin went. So an hour in the hive. Oh, there he is. You. Yeah. <laughs> he has. It was you. You. <laughs> Go ahead. I saw you had buccaneer plums on there. I yes. They're native. I, in Miami, I was able to grow four from seed, but wow. I haven't had any luck finding any more of them up here. Do you know where I could get them? I do, and they're very expensive. So I'm, that, that's going to give you the heads up. Is that the? Um, I'm trying to think. Jeff Nurge probably has them. Um, we have them. They're super expensive. I'm trying to think who else. Um, but. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, you could, but, you know, go on, there's a website called Plant Ant. You can go on there, it won't give you the prices, but it will give you availability. There's a plant, Plant Ant. A-N-T. A-N-T, Plant Ant. There's actually a nursery and homestead, which is a really long drive. That's, um, Plant Creations is actually open to retail. And I think they have buccaneers, but call, always call ahead of time. So that would be plant creations and homestead for some rare stuff. But try your local people first and see if they can get it for you. Jeff Nurge might be able to get it for you at, um, what's his nursery again? I don't even remember. <laughs> oh, Native Choice, right. Okay, in the back, I'm sorry. Yes. 
So it's funny, if, you know, if you read Julia Morton, basically they can't get in there, but sometimes they actually rob the flowers, so they actually get, drill a hole in there. Sometimes they, they get into the side lip, so they're not getting as much nectar as they can, but, but they do like the fire bush. And, and yes. So I like perennial peanut, and actually I was asking Eric if he's ever seen any honeybees in the perennial peanut. Have you? I don't, I, I don't um, you have. have any to really look at, okay. but I know between I-95 and Australia and Okeechobee, there's lots of it growing right. little yellow flowers. Yeah. Oh, 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 are you all right? Wow. Okay. So, so are you saying that you've seen bees in the perennial peanut? I haven't either. So... I do like it. I do like perennial peanut. So I like perennial peanut. You know, ground covers are always a thing that people are looking for, and I like to do, like my landscape, I like to do a mixed ground cover. I don't like monocultural landscapes. So I would do mimosa. I would do lyre leaf sage that has beautiful uh, uh, purple flower spikes in the salvia family in the spring. Um, and you can mow it when it's finished. I mean, so that works. I like a mixture. Fleabane is a great one. I don't know if you can buy that. Um, it, it just kind of pops up. Mimosa's, mimosa's cool, but also the perennial peanut, I've used that for clients in really dry areas, they love it. Okay. So that's, I'm so glad you asked that. So I actually grow vegetables and herbs in the winter too. And what I do for my bees is I let my herbs go to flower. My bees love it. They love basil, they love cilantro, the tomatoes, the peppers. Um, you know, they pollinate that all year, but they love the herbs and I let them go to flower and I let them reseed themselves. Um, and the bees really do appreciate that. So if you have some container garden, you know, again, this is for small beekeepers, isn't, but they love it. In fact, right, where we are right now, I've got like five different varieties of basil and cilantro and the bees in the winter when there's nothing else really, really love it and appreciate it. So I did find that with broccoli that I let go to flower, I had a big patch, it made the worst honey. It was disgusting. It was disgusting. <laughs> oh, and so this year I cut all my broccoli. They didn't get those flowers. It was nasty. <laughs> so, yeah, so definitely go to the herbs and, and um, I'm sorry, one Yes, go ahead. Is there a difference between wax myrtle and crape myrtle? Yes, there's a big difference. So wax myrtle, what is the botanical name? I can't remember. Morella serifera. Morella It's similar to bayberry. Right. So it's male and female. The wax myrtle is male and female. They make wax candles from it. You know, it's kind of a wetland shrub. It's short-lived. Um, the females have tiny little berries. But the bees, you know what, like we have some plant in our perimeter and when our bees swarm, they always go into the wax myrtle, which is good in a way because it's lower growing and I can retrieve them. So wax myrtles can benefit you in other ways rather than getting in a 50 foot oak tree that you can't get them back. Um, the crate myrtle, that's the one that um, flowers in the summer. There's watermelon red. It's got like that peely bark, um, but then the winter it's completely deciduous. Is that good for bees? You know, I, I can't recall. I don't think, I can't, yeah, yeah, I can't recall. And this is why I'm saying that we should really compile this list. This would be great for people buying home, you know, a home or planting for their bees. Yes, sir. Here's the funny thing is I can agree with you down here that I don't really see bees on the gray myrtle. Okay. But north of here, okay. I grew okay. up with a gray myrtle in my backyard that is the bees almost broke the branches that you so have to so, and I've noticed that with, with, with foraging as well. And bees, depending upon where you are and what else is available. And it can be the timing of the year. Like, like uh, Angie had a, a couple months back, she had three inches of rain. We hadn't had any rain for, since March. And so our bees really didn't, you know, the, the plants weren't producing a great amount of nectar. The bees were kind of hungry. Um, so it really depends on a lot of different things. It's not just the flower, it's what the environment is if it's raining all the time then the nectar gets washed out if there's no rain there's no nectar being provided so there's a lot of variables and also where you are I mean I've seen um, some plants
plants I've never seen a bee on, just loaded with bees because there was nothing else available. So they'll, they'll definitely, they have their, their priorities of what they like. Like for us, you know, it might be lobster to a hot dog. So, you know, hot dog's food, but we don't really love it. So. And also the soil that it's growing in is completely different in Louisiana. Okay, right. In the time of the year and everything else yeah. as well. So, but, but concentrating in this location, I think, would, would be beneficial to extending this, um, this Julia Morton um, baseline. Go ahead, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, I have a bunch of green across the way, and they like the red ones a lot. They don't really have to go with the white ones. Interesting. So, you know, it, it also with like native plants, there's been um, selections of native plants where they've been hybridized or, and there seems to be very little nectar or food being offered for some of our, like there was a, a which, which one in particular was a firebush? They had this um, one that they selected, it was cultivated, it was called Firefly and nothing was in it. So be careful what you're buying too. Like with Angie, she has the true Hamelia patens, which is our true native firebush. A lot of nurseries are offering the Mexican firebush or they call it the dwarf firebush or the South African firebush. Um, so there is a difference and that's why it's really important to have your science name, your botanical name, so that you know what you're getting and not just, you know, oh, it's, it's a milkweed. Well, what kind of milkweed is it? So that, you know, it, it tells you exactly what that is. Um, Isn't that also true with the lantana? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we do have two native lantanas. One that has just been so corrupted that you're not going to get the true one. The other one in Volcrata. And, um, and then there's a lot of non-native lantanas as well. And some, though, especially for a lot of these people that have livestock, it's poisonous. So knowing what you're getting is really important. Do some homework. Um, it, that's why it would be great to expand on this to, to help everybody have that homework done for them. Go ahead. I just wanted to add a comment that okay. when we moved here 26 years ago, you couldn't go anywhere to find information on Florida plants. Right. Mm -hmm. and now, it took a while. Mm -hmm. to, to address the app, there are so many good books. Yeah. Out there we actually have some very good local <laughs> authors too. Rafino is one of them. Mark Minow, he actually does butterflies, but he's involved in a lot of different things. and. Mark yeah, so we have some local authors that are just brilliant. Go to some of the Native Plant Society meetings if you can, um, depending on who's, who they have speaking. You know, the auction, I think they actually have Rafino, who wrote a couple of Florida Native Plants. He'll be at the auction, and he's, he's, he gives an excellent description about plants um, so that you learn a little bit more. So, you know, it's funny. We know a lot about plants. I'm still learning about bees. <laughs> so, but that's the next chapter. Um, so the, the Florida land So it's interesting. There's a variation. Um, so well, that's not that. That one's a different one altogether. So the the one, the true Florida native, is the lantana and volcrata. And there's a white has more white, and some of them have been selected to have a little bit like a, a pink or purple tinge. But it's the same one. It's short lived. It doesn't live a long time. You know, a lot of those. It it's drought tolerant, doesn't like it too wet. Um, the bees do like it. Uh, again, high variety. Put that in your wildflower garden. That's what I would recommend. You know, don't put that in your perimeter garden. Put it in your wildflower garden. What about your blue weed? So same thing. It's hard to really get the true porter weed. Um, you know, some people say it's invasive, and I'm going to do a one to ten on invasive. You know, they say um, the milkweed, the um, the curus avica is, is invasive. And you know what? It, I see it in disturbed areas. It comes in and goes. And to me, something invasive is taking over a natural area, you know, becoming a huge problem in that, in that aspect. So the porter weed, it pops up, it disappears. I've, I've never seen it displace anything or, or take over. You know, I'm trying to think. So I have seen some. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's small. That's small enough. Carrot wood, nasty. The air leaf acacia, nasty. You know, things like that. Even the ardesia, the, the climbing fern, nasty. You don't want stuff like that. I think we saw some of that at Sarah's, too. The climbing fern? Or was that at Jane's? I'm trying to remember who's. Oh, it was at Angie's. It was Angie's we saw that at. I was like, I saw it, and I was like, the hairs on my arm went up, and I'm like, get on this, you know? So, right. 
it has these fine like little minute it's really ears. really difficult fine, so I'll have to keep watching to keep and get on it because in like in one summer it can just cover the canopy and smother everything out it's nasty I took them out the week after oh you're so good I wish all my <laughs> clients listened to me like you <laughs> okay I'm sorry uh, I'm always looking when I'm in Home Depot to see what I see the bees on. And okay. So I yeah. yeah. So I would be careful buying my plants from Home Depot, <laughs> especially for. You know, there, there's a lot. See, I'm not a purist. I like a lot of non-natives as well. Um, in my yard, I don't have Mexican heather. It's short-lived. It's okay. It's not a bad plant. Do you, do, it's not a bad plant. And if, and if your bees are happy, then put it in your wildflower garden. It's short-lived. It's not going to live forever. It's okay. Home Depot is not a place I'd be buying my plants. So it's, um, and, and I don't want to be sued, but they use a lot of chemicals so it and and other things as well a lot of systemics and you know so again when you're buying your plants look for some damage you want to see plants that have little brown spots or leaves eaten you know if it's looking too perfect it's a, there's a problem so that's how I judge yes sir I just had one quite well not okay if you are going to come to this uh, one on one workshop tomorrow, make sure you bring your B suits, okay? Come with your protective clothes. Exactly. You know what? We ha we actually have a nice setup. It's under our breezeway in the barn, so it's cool. You can get you know undressed and dressed in that. And then the apiary that we have is is fenced in for to keep out the bufo frogs. So, but um, definitely bring your. I'm sorry. It has so far. <laughs> so far, it's worked. Yeah, right. But um, but make sure if you're coming tomorrow, um, make sure that you do bring your bee suits and not shorts or sandals. Dress up. You know, you don't want to get stung. If you do, you do. But it, it's nice when you can avoid that. Yes. I'm sorry? So I haven't really seen a lot of bees in the trumpet plants, like Brunfelsia. I'm sorry? What type of flowers do they like? Like big I mean, if you, if, right, sun, actually, he, he's right. They love sunflowers. So you're looking to make yourself happy, too. Is that, that, so, so my suggestion, you know what? I actually have a lot of clients, like, you know, I want color, and, and I'm just like, you know what? Get a tree, get orchids. You know what? They don't take up a lot of space. They don't take up a lot of time. I love my cattleyas. They try to trick the bees all the time. Oh well, sorry bee, but they're you know they're in my face, and those have gorgeous, beautiful f flowers. And that, and again, you're not using valuable landscape or retail space, you know, uh, landscape space for something, you know, like a Hong Kong orchid tree or something like that. That's just you can do so much better. You saw, yeah. I mean, they, you know, the bees know what they want. It's not always what we want. I'm sorry. I have, you know what? I don't do hibiscus, and so I, so I can't say. I, okay. Pavonia? Is it the Panama rose? No, it has like hibiscus. Oh, I know what he's talking about. You, you know the the um, the, you know the thing that bloomed at the end of the year last year with the pink flowers, and it has the nasty seeds on it near the beehive. Caesar weed. Caesar weed. Caesar weed. Okay, I don't know. Okay. Okay. So they like Caesar weed too. So and that's that's kind of like a an annual. It pops up. It disappears. It is, mm -hmm. yeah, and a lot of people don't like it because of the sticky seeds on it and everything like that. But the bees seem to really forage on that, so so it's it's more it's more wet, yeah. So I, okay, one more question. I'm sorry. Yes. Oh my God! This is a gr this is my top ten. What is it too? <laughs> so this is a this is a sable palm. So this is our Florida state tree. So it has long flower spikes on it in the summer, in the summer months. It's great for bees, butterflies, 
of uh, migratory birds when it produces fruit. It has boots. It's a whole ecosystem. It protects your home from hurricanes. It's a great tree. No thorns. It's, it's in a hammock, so you would find that in a hammock with other trees. Um, if, come to the workshop tomorrow and you can see these things. You can see them mature and it will help you get a better understanding of how to use them. You know, sometimes knowing a plant, you see it either in the wild or used well in the landscape and then you, it's kind of like, aha, now I get it.